Welcome to the Self Principle Podcast with Dr. Sean Hashmi. The Self Principle is a time tested, evidence based approach to optimize your life based on four tenets sleep is medicine, exercise is medicine, love is medicine, and food is medicine. Each week, Dr. Hashmi and his guests dive into the latest research on health, nutrition, fitness, and wellness to help you live your best life. Here's your host, Dr. Sean Hashmi. Welcome to Self Principle. Today we're going to talk about milk. And it's one of those topics that I get asked all the time about. Is milk good for you? Is milk bad for you? Is the truth somewhere in the middle? So instead of giving you my opinion, let's talk about what the data shows and you can decide for yourself. So milk consumption's origin really goes back to about 9,000 to 7,000 BC is the first trace of milk consumption back in Mesopotamia and a little bit sooner in Americas. And what we know about that time is at that time, the people lacked the lactase enzyme. And that's basically the enzyme that's needed to break down the milk sugar lactose. Otherwise, you had all sorts of stomach cramps and GI stuff like diarrhea and so forth. Now, in terms of Europe, what's also interesting is, is that the lactase enzyme allele really didn't come around until about 3,000 to 5,000 years ago. And now 90% of Northern Europe has it. So in Northern Europe, it's different than looking at, for example, Asia or South America, where that allele is very uncommon. Now, the real question is, why do we drink milk? And the answer is, no one really knows, whether it's for starvation reasons, whether it was because it's rich in nutrients, no one has an answer to that question. But what we do know is that in, since the 70s, what we have seen in milk consumption, that it has steadily gone down. In fact, if you look at some of the data, 1996, you were drinking about 24 gallons on average has gone down to about 17 gallons per year. So all of milk consumption has gone down except for the craze around low fat milk consumption, which really started to increase in the 70s and kind of leveled out in the 90s. Now, when we look at milk consumption and we look at calcium consumption, what does the data tell us? Well, if you look back on it, it turns out there was only a single study that talked about what is the amount of calcium we really need. And the study only lasted 18 days and there wasn't a lot of people, only about 155 people in there. And so they came up with this number of 741 milligrams per day. But look at the range. The range was between 415 to 1740 milligrams per day. So massive range. And this was a really, really short study. And what the study didn't tell us is, what does that mean to have a neutral calcium balance? Does that mean your risk of fractures goes down? Does that mean you're going to live longer? Is there any health benefits? And the answer was that study wasn't designed to tell us yet. It was the basis for the recommendation for calcium intake. Now, when we look at calcium, I'm sorry, when we look at milk consumption, what we do find is the current recommendation is actually a lot higher than what people are consuming. And the popularity of milk has steadily gone down. What's fascinating about milk, just like when we look at breast milk and cow's milk, cow's milk has all of these essential nutrients for the newborn calf and it has over 50 different hormones. But if you're a farmer and you need to increase the production of milk coming from cows, what ends up happening is, is all these cows over the year have been bred to produce high amounts of IGF-1. And so in order to make the cows constantly produce milk, unfortunately, they have to also be pregnant most of the time. And so they have higher amounts of progestin and estrogen in their blood that also ends up in the cow's milk. So let's take a look at this fascinating graph. And what it shows is if you look at the United States and you look at countries, the higher the portion of total energy coming from milk, so basically countries that are drinking more milk, the higher the correlation for fractures. And then if you look at the bottom line with all of this stuff, what we really are saying is, is that the evidence so far doesn't really support the idea that higher amounts of dairy is somehow going to be linked to fracture prevention. This is specific for hip fractures. All right, let's look at bone loss. So calcium supplements is such a massive supplement industry. I mean, the sales in 2015, 1.15 billion, that's billion with a B. So when you look at calcium supplements on the data side, what it shows is that you get about a 1% increase in bone health. But if you stop taking the supplements, that effect does not last. In fact, it goes back or it reverse. So essentially, you get the 1% and you have to keep taking the calcium supplements to maintain that 1%. What about growth? 
But what we do know is people who consume, especially at a younger age, higher amounts of dairy products, they tend to grow a little bit taller than those that don't. And that's because part of milk is rich in things like amino acids, like leucine, isoleucine, valine. And what we know is, is also with milk, you get higher IGF-1, which ends up mediating the effects of growth hormone, which causes bones to grow, muscles to grow, bodies to grow. And also leucine is important in preventing the breakdown of cells and also helping cells to keep dividing. Now that may sound like a good thing, but think about in cancer, where you have rapidly dividing cells that are uncontrolled in that development. Now, for those people who are like, well, you know, I'm not that tall and so forth, wherever you are and whoever you are, remember you are beautiful, you are wonderful just the way you are. So you gotta learn to love yourself. And for people who are worried about being too tall, being too tall may not be all that it's cut out to be. In fact, the taller you are, the higher the risk of cancers, fractures, and even blood clots. With weight loss, even though dairy and calcium was all the craze for a while, the data really doesn't support the idea that higher amounts of dairy is linked to higher amounts of weight loss. Same thing with blood pressure. The data, the data doesn't support that higher dairy intake will somehow be linked to either higher or lower blood pressure. With cholesterol, what we find is, is that higher intakes of things like butter, for example, you will find that your total cholesterol compared to your good cholesterol is higher so in other words, the odds of you having overall higher amounts of bad cholesterol goes up as the dairy intake goes up. Then when we start to look at dairy studies, what's really interesting is you always have to look at, not just with dairy, but with any study, who are the people that are actually responsible? So who paid for the study? What's the disclosure like? And you'll find a lot of dairy studies are funded by folks in the dairy industry. So. These were some really large studies that was interesting to see who the funding was. Now let's look at a study that wasn't funded by the dairy industry. In this particular case, what they found was higher intakes of high fat dairy was linked to higher incidence of heart disease. But now let's look at an overall spectrum. So if you take red meat, which we've talked about as having the highest risk. So if you start with red meat and processed meat, and then you compare that to dairy, dairy has a lower risk. If you go to fish, fish has an even lower risk of heart disease. And of course, my favorite, if you go to nuts, nuts have even a lower risk compared to low fat dairy or fish. So what happens if you replace dairy and what's the risk of heart disease? So if you replace 5% of the energy that's coming from dairy fat with, let's say, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is nuts, you have a 24% reduction in cardiac coronary vascular disease. And if you look at vegetable fats, you have a 10% reduction in cardiovascular disease. And then if you look at animal fats, as expected, you have a increase. So in other words, replacing dairy fat with more animal fat does the opposite effect. It increases the risk for cardiovascular diseases. With type 1 diabetes, what's interesting is cow's milk has bovine insulin. Now, bovine insulin is very similar to human insulin in that it's only different by about three amino acids. So in a really interesting study, what they found was that if infants were exposed to cow's milk at a really young time, they actually developed these IgG antibodies. And those antibodies job it is, is to attack things that are bad in our bodies and kill it. So these IgG antibodies developed, and then these antibodies could cross react with insulin, human insulin, because the difference is so little, just three amino acids. And where does human insulin comes from? The beta cells in the pancreas. So if you look at all of these beta cells, well, those antibodies can potentially go and attack those beta cells. Now in type two diabetes, on the other hand, what we find is, is that one, there isn't really a link between dairy correlating or causing type two diabetes. In fact, higher amounts of yogurt intake is actually linked to lower incidence of type two diabetes unlike where there's probably an environmental trigger with type 1 diabetes and milk intake. So with type 2 diabetes and one serving per day of total dairy, you don't really have an incidence or correlation with it. Or if you do, it may even be a little bit on the negative side. Then with acne, this was kind of an interesting study because the question they asked really isn't 
a well-designed study, they said, have you ever had physician diagnosed with teenage acne? And the answer that they got was essentially saying that people who consumed higher intakes of dairy, meaning more than three servings a day, actually had higher risk of severe acne by 22%. Now, when we talk about estrogen, what's really interesting here is with cow's milk, what we know is, is because of the way we need the cows to produce milk all the time, they have to be pregnant, so therefore they have higher amounts of estrogen and progesterone in the blood. And people who consume higher intakes of cow's milk, what we find is that they have higher incidences of estrogen and progesterone. And in men, they have lower LH, lower FSH, and lower testosterone in men. So the bottom line that occurs here is, is really the estrogen in milk, it does get absorbed. And the gonadotropin secretion can be suppressed such that in men, you may have lower testosterone. And in women, you may have, especially if you're prepubertal, though, you may have sexual maturation at an earlier age. And all of this may be impacted specifically by the higher concentrations of estrogen in milk. All right, let's look at cancer. So what do we know about the incidence of cancer with milk? Well, it's correlated. But the correlation is there. It's a point we correlation with breast cancer as we start to think about that. And then the United States is there on the chart. Now, milk is also linked with ovarian cancer and uterine cancer. And then with milk and cheese, you also have a significant correlation over to uterine cancer. So really, the question that becomes is, is because of milk high concentration of estrogen and progesterone, is there a link between it potentially increasing the risk for us having cancers? What about prostate cancer? What we find is once again, highest versus lowest total dairy intake, we see a 9% higher risk, 7% higher risk if you're going by about 400 grams per day. But essentially what the data is really saying is, is as you have either higher total dairy intake or higher milk intake, you're gonna have a higher risk not causation, correlation, higher risk of prostate cancer. And if you look at total mortality, what you find is this is meaning the risk of dying from anything. And you find that there isn't an association between dairy, excuse me, and all cause mortality, heart disease, cardiovascular disease. But in studies like this, which was pretty recent in 2017, so you find that once again, there's lots of conflicts of interest. So anytime you start to read this data and you start to see that you always have to look for conflict of interest. So in a flip side, this is just uh, from last year, 2019, you find highest versus lowest intake of total dairy. The risk of all cause mortality goes higher. And in this particular case, the conflict of interest is the California Walnut Commission. So maybe the walnut guys have something to do with pushing dairy away and trying to go for something of their own. Now, substituting dairy and what happens? So here we go. If you take total mortality and you say, let's say the risk of dying of anything. <coughs> let's look at total mortality and let's substitute one serving per day of total dairy for nuts. Just like before, when we talked about heart disease, risk of dying goes down, whole grains goes down, but if you look at red meat, it goes up. So once again, red meat and processed meat is higher than it's dairy, than it's fish, than we get into plant-based sources. All right, now one of the questions that always comes up is what about organic and grass-fed milk? So is somehow organic grass-fed dairy milk somehow better? Well, milk from cows has our best, which has higher incidence of IGF-1. What's interesting about it is, is there aren't any long-term studies that compare Arbest in cows versus those that weren't treated with Arbest, and what is the outcome or impact of all of that? So it turns out that Canadian and European unions actually banned milk sale from Arbest, and this was back in 1990, but they didn't do it because somehow it was better for health for us. They did it because there was increased problems in the cows. So the cows couldn't stay healthy enough to produce the milk that they wanted. So there was increased mastitis with problems, reduced fertility, which really for them wasn't a good thing because they need lots and lots of cows to produce lots and lots of milk. 
So this concept of RBEST, or recombinant bovine somatotropin, what it does is it's a hormone that's designed to essentially cause the cows to grow larger, to produce more milk. And the concept here really is, is that RBEST has higher IGF-1. And remember, cows treated with RBEST, if they have higher IGF-1, IGF-1 is linked to certain cancers like breast and um, prostate cancer. So with United States, what's interesting is if you buy milk in the United States, U.S. does not require companies to label RBEST. Now, the companies are specifically saying that the milk is made from cows not treated with RBEST. That's different. But otherwise, they don't have to label that. And no surprise there, Monsanto uh, RBEST was a Monsanto product approved in 1993. All right. This is a lot of data. But I wanted you guys to have enough data so you can kind of make your own decision on where you stand off in milk. So here's some really take home points. First, cow's new milk nutrients are really available from lots of sources. In all of the research that I've done looking at all of this data, I can't find any reason for why there's something in cow's milk that you can't get from almond milk, soy milk, etc., that you absolutely need. So if you eat a balanced diet of lots of whole foods, lots of plants, you're gonna get everything you need with the exception of B12 that you need to supplement with. And then in terms of fractures, once again, the data does not support dairy for somehow protective against fractures. If anything, there's about a 1% increase in bone density, but that goes away if you stop. And higher dairy is linked with certain cancers like prostate and endometrial cancers. But other cancers like colorectal cancer, there's actually lower risk in that case. And dairy foods, even though they're better than red meat or let's say sugar-sweetened beverages, they are still worse than plant-based foods. So at the end of the day, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That's Michael Pollan's line. I absolutely love those seven words. And I still think that absolutely applies. The more you eat plants, whole foods, plant-based diet is a really excellent way of eating, the better off you're going to be. And lastly, there is no real clear benefit to somehow low fat versus whole fat. And for people who are out there thinking, look, I still want my calcium. I don't know where to get it. Don't forget, kale, broccoli, tofu, nuts, beans are excellent sources to be able to get calcium. And most of us get plenty of nutrients where we don't really need to worry about it. Base diet. 